Method Development and Validation by Craig Webster, Consultant Clinical Scientist at University Hospitals, Birmingham. Method validation is the process of testing a measurement procedure to assess its performance. This is to determine whether its performance is clinically acceptable and fit for purpose. Validation is usually undertaken for non-standard methods, laboratory developed methods, standard methods used outside of their intended scope, and validated methods that have subsequently been modified. Method verification on the other hand is the process of the experimental confirmation of performance specifications by the user. Usually this would include an assessment of bias or imprecision. Verification typically refers to assays or procedures that have already been validated, for example, by the manufacturer, and that will be adopted by the laboratory without modification. The first point in any validation exercise is to define what we are going to measure, i.e. the measurement. We also at this point define the success of the measurement. Fitness for purpose in this case means that the measurement procedure measure what it intends to measure and the uncertainty in the measurement of results is acceptable. The method should be fully developed and optimized. A written standard operating procedure for the method should be available. The measurement instruments to be used should be regularly and technically controlled and well maintained. And the persons performing the measurement should have sufficient training and experience for the task. Appropriate calibrators should be available and a supply of a suitable material at at least two concentrations for internal quality control purposes must be available. The needs of the end user regarding fitness for purpose of the method should also be known. In summary, a validation would take place when you are validating a new method. For example, this could include in-house assays or tests where there's no appropriate international marking standard available or for where method validation information is not available. You could also validate a modified manufacturer's method and validation should be performed on all assays or tests that are used against the manufacturer's specification, e.g. the procedure is changed or the sample types used are not what the manufacturer recommends. You should also validate methods when the following a major change to a previously validated parameters of the equipment, for example, IT changes or software or method updates within the laboratory. Verification of procedures to test to what extent performance data are obtained by the manufacturer during a validation can be reproduced in the environments of the end user. This is possible if the method, i.e. the reagents, the procedure and the measurement instrument is by a manufacturer or a company or other reliable source in which have, which have performed proper method validation and who is providing you with detailed results. If a CE stroke UK CA bank product or an FDA approved product uh, or an evidence based professional guideline, i.e., from the WHO, is to be used without modification, it is necessary for the laboratory to complete independent verification for them. If a CE or UK CA mark product or an evidence based professional guideline, for example, from the WHO, is to be used without modification, it is necessary for the laboratory to complete an independent verification before the method is introduced into routine use. This is also necessary even if the manufacturer has provided validation data. The laboratory needs to confirm that the performance claims which are relevant to the intended use for the examination procedure have been met. When a calibrator is chosen for that method, the metrological traceability, that is where the result can be related to a reference material or reference procedure of higher metrological order for a documented unbroken chain of calibration, this should always be considered. Verification may also take place during the establishment of reference intervals. This is because all laboratory test results are interpreted by comparison with reference data, not only from healthy individuals, but also from patients with relevant diseases. The International Federation of Clinical Chemistry and Laboratory Medicine recommends the term reference values, which encompasses reference intervals for healthy individuals or specific groups of patients. The term normal range is now considered obsolete because it often is, is misinterpreted and should not be used. Often separate reference values are needed for specific groups, in particular sex and age partitioning criteria, and these are often used because several analyzed vary significantly amongst different age and gender groups. There are recognized standards available for verification and the EP15-A2 document from CLSI is a very good starting point for any verification exercise. It uses control material with a sign concentration, for example, from external quality control or certified reference materials. 
It does not, however, test for matrix effect, which may occur in patient materials. But it is a practical and pragmatic method using patient samples and common samples for internal quality control. In a verification experiment, bias is one of the most important experiments, and bias can be tested by comparison with well-established methods using at least 20 patient samples. The other most important assessment is of imprecision, and variation within and between series is measured using the normally used stable materials or internal quality control. Further details are found in this URL. These procedures are aimed at establishing realistic expectations with the analyst and confidence with the end user that the methods are fit for the intended purpose. For each new validation or verification of a new assay or process, a risk assessment must be considered to establish the risk to the changing process. Areas to be considered include safety, reputation, and the resources required to provide or enable that change. A key point in validation or verification exercises is the fit for the intended purpose. There are no specifications that are universally applicable, but it is the clinical requirement of the assays which determine which quality specifications are needed. The gold standard and medical usefulness requirements which are set are used to set analytical performance specifications. These could be based on the evaluation of the effects of analytical. Choosing the right specifications is important. Medical usefulness requirements are used to set analytical performance specification, and these can be based on the evaluation of the effect of analytical performance on clinical outcomes in specific clinical settings. This is the gold standard should be used wherever possible. However, it's not always possible to access that data, and the evaluation of the effects of analytical performance on clinical decisions in general can be based on data obtained from components of biological variation or data based on the analysis of clinical opinion. You can also get specifications from published professional recommendations, for example, national and international expert bodies or expert local groups or individuals. Performance goals can also be set by regulatory bodies or organisers of EQA schemes, and there may be goals set on the current state of the art, as demonstrated by data from EQA or assurance schemes, or found in method and current publications on the methodology. This hierarchy is based on the consensus agreement published in the Scandinavian Journal of Clinical Laboratory Investigation in 1999. Biological variation, therefore, is one of the most useful ways of setting analytical performance specifications. Biological variation data describes the variability of clinically important measurements around homeostatic set points within subjects CVI and between subjects CVG. This data can then be used to set analytical performance specifications. In the case of imprecision, the imprecision target, CVA, which is the analytical um, CV, should be less than 0.5 times the CVI. The 0.5 refers to the desirable analytical performance specification. The factor for optimum and minimum performance specifications are arbitrarily set to 0.25 and 0.75, respectively. Bias specifications can be set at less than 0.25, the sum of the squares of CVI and CVG square rooted. The formula for bias is intended to be used for laboratories to be able to use the same reference limits. The factor 0.25 again refers to the desirable analytical performance specification. The factors for optimum and minimum performance specifications are 0.125 and 0.375 respectively. The choice of which factor to use depends on your intended use. You can also use the biological variation to set the maximum allowable measurement uncertainty. In this case, bias should in principle be eliminated and all remaining sources of variation added linearly as variances. Accordingly, the maximum allowable standard measurement uncertainty can then be set as 0.5 times CVI and the maximum expanded allowable measurement uncertainty will be K multiplied by 0.5 multiplied by CVI. In this case, K is the coverage factor, for example, two or three to obtain a confidence interval of 95 or 99%. The most commonly used coverage factor is two. Thus, maximum allowable measurement uncertainty can be calculated as less than two times 0.5 multiplied the CVI. Again, the factor 0.5 refers to the desirable specification. The optimum minimal performance specifications are arbitrarily set at 0.25 and 0.75 respectively. 
for most measure ends, it's, it is for the moment probably best to use the factor 0 0.75. Biological variation can also be allowed to set a total allowable error budget. This formula considers both bias and imprecision and was developed for EQA organizers and has been widely applied since it is easy to use and is detailed here. However, this conventional model for deriving total allowable error from biological variation is flawed as it sums up two mutually exclusive terms, that is maximum allowable bias and maximum allowable imprecision. This results in an overestimation of allowable total error. For these reasons, this approach should be applied with caution. In general, when performing experiments, the type of error that we wish to determine can be roughly boiled down to these particular experiments. So for example, random error can be determined by replication, proportional error by recovery, so on and so forth. The results of those experiments are then compared to your specification standard. Imprecision is how reproducible are the results produced. And this is usually expressed as the coefficient of variation, which is standard deviation divided by the mean. And the standard illustrations of precise and imprecise biased and unbiased assays is detailed on the slide. In terms of the minimum required for a verification, imprecision, comparability, and assessment of bias should be performed. Imprecision, intra-batch imprecision, which is the within-batch operator, and inter-batch imprecision, which is the between-batch operator, can be measured and determined. Repeat measurements should be made at two or more concentrations, which reflect clinically important decision points. This can be done either using patient pooled samples or reference materials. The clinical justification is required for the selection of IQC concentrations used, and these are usually around important decision points with the method. The number of repeat measurements is dependent on the assay, and as a rough guide, at least 10 to 20 replicates should be used. The mean and standard, de the mean and standard deviation should be calculated on a percent CV determined, and the acceptance criteria is that the CV is equal or better than the defined target set before the exercise takes place. Inter-batch imprecision is the most important as this is the variability which will be observed by clinicians. The NCCLS proposes extensive guidelines for evaluating and testing the precision. And this enables the determination of total and within run variation, which again can be claimed. This allows the assessment of total and within one this allows the assessment of total and within run variation, which can then be compared against the manufacturer's performance claim or the analytical performance specification to determine whether the observed variation is significantly worse than claimed or required. A comparability experiment should be performed. This is not the same as assessing accuracy of a measurement system. Samples should be analysed using both the new and existing method and a wide assay range should be chosen where EQA or standard reference materials or patient samples are compared between methods. The number required will depend on the assay being verified. A sufficient number is required to ensure confidence in the accuracy of the method, particularly at clinically important decision points. Once analysis is complete, data should be compared using the appropriate statistical techniques, i.e. bland analysis or passing bomb block regression. Linearity is the confirmation of a method. Confirmation of linearity of a method is not always a requirement for verification of a method. However, it is advisable that an accurate procedure is available for diluting samples above the measurement interval. And this is particularly important for tumor markers, hormones, and enzymes. Nonlinearity may include non-linearity may indicate gross errors due to incorrect software settings a malfunction in the fluid handling system, or the use of inappropriate dilution. Nonlinearity may indicate gross errors due to incorrect software settings, a malfunction in liquid handling, or the use of inappropriate diluents. The procedure is as follows. Identify a patient with a high concentration of measurand and set the instrument to make three different dilutions of the sample and measure the concentration in duplicate at those three diluted points. Using calibrated pipettes, simulate the instrument's dilutions and measure the concentration of the samples in duplicate. Defining the manual dilution as the expected concentration, 
and the instrument dilution is the observed concentration, compare the difference between the two means. If the means are not within 15% of each other, investigate the cause. Linearity of the assay should be assessed along with any automatic diluting protocols. A high concentration sample should be chosen and serial dilution carried out to cover the required linear range. Again, using an appropriate material which will not affect the again using a, an appropriate material which will not affect the matrix of the sample. For example, using assay specific diluent or a zero calibrator. Ideally, each sample should be measured in triplicate and a mean taken but this may not be practical if sample volumes are high and the expected concentration should be plotted against the and the expected concentration should be plotted against the actual concentration and a straight line on the identity line should be observed if there isn't a straight line on the identity line again explanation should be sought other experiments that may be performed but aren't strictly ne necessary are limit of blank and the blank in this case should be as similar as possible to the patient's sample. Ideally, it would be a compilation of measurements on a number of blank samples because matrix difference exists from sample to sample. Analysis should take place a number of times depending on the assay and ideally at different times throughout the batch. The mean is then calculated and compared to the manufacturer's claims. Extending this further, the limit of detection the limit of detection is the lowest concentration where an analyte can be detected 95% of the time. The limit of detection can be calculated using the formula indicated, and then this should be compared to the manufacturer's claims where possible, or compared to an acceptable clinical decision values from published guidelines. Limit of quantitation. The relative uncertainty of measurements at or just exceeding the limit of detection may be large. The limit of quantitation relates to the total error being considered being acceptable for the assay. In order to obtain this, repeat measurements of a sample at a concentration as close as possible to the limit of quantitation should be performed. The exact number is dependent on the method, but 10 as a minimum should be considered. The percent CV should be calculated and considered in relation to the clinical context, i.e. the target specification that was set at the beginning of this exercise. If the percent CV is too great, it may be necessary to increase the limit of quantitation until the CV meets the required target. When results are used to diagnose a particular disease or condition, it may be useful to establish diagnostic sensitivity and specificity. The sensitivity of a diagnostic test quantifies its ability to correctly identify subjects with the disease condition. It is the proportion of true positives that are correctly identified by the test. The specificity of a test is the ability of a test to correctly identify subjects without the condition. It is the proportion of true negatives that are correctly identified by the test. The analytical specificity of an assay is the ability to determine specifically the concentration of the target analyte in the presence of potentially interfering substances, which may occur in the sample matrix. For example, hemolysis, bilirubin, hyperlipidemia, anticoagulants, etc. Assay claims can be verified by the analysis of samples with and without interference spikes into them. The results should then be compared to see if they are clinically significant. The majority of manufacturers recommend that the laboratory derive their own reference intervals for the local population they serve. This may not always be possible for practical reasons. The source of all reference ranges used within a laboratory should however be recorded. Usually this is required for accreditation purposes. Where a reference interval is to be determined, the following principles should be considered. The IFCC recommends a minimum of 120 values, and they also recommend the use of non-parametric statistics, as this makes no assumption about the distribution of data. Therefore, at least 120 individuals are required for each group if partitioning criteria to be considered, for example, for age or gender. Where it is not practically possible to obtain 120 reference values for each group, the minimum number will be used to provide sufficient statistical power to obtain reasonable confidence intervals. It goes without saying that the pre-analytical it goes without saying that the pre-analytical collection procedures used when reference values are being established should be as similar as practically possible to those used in routine analysis of a patient specimen. Qualitative assay verification and validation essentially follows the same procedures outlined. In terms of comparability, there are some differences. 
Samples should be analyzed using both the new and existing methods. Samples should be chosen which represent all method classifications. The number of samples required will depend on the assay being verified, and a sufficient number is required to ensure that the confidence in the accuracy of the method, particularly at those clinically important decision points, is assured. Once analysis is complete, data should be compared using a two-way contingency table, the aim of which is to have 100% concordance between the two methods. If not, an explanation must be given as to why the difference is acceptable. Accuracy can be assessed using EQA or standard reference materials where possible. All sample types which could potentially be used for an assay should be verified as well as any stability claims by the manufacturer. If the laboratory intends to use samples beyond the stability advised by the manufacturer or guideline, it will be necessary that that stability data is obtained by the laboratory on a range of sample concentrations. Only those sample types should be used within the stability conditions verified. Any change in the collection sample device will also require re-verification of the device and the assay. Carryover will indicate the extent to which a measurement of an analyte is likely to be affected by the preceding sample. This can be particularly important in measurement of high concentration compounds, for example, tumor markers or in toxicology. Ideally, you would measure a high concentration sample in triplicate, immediately followed by a specimen with lower concentration again in triplicate, and carryover percentage can be determined by this formula. In this case, I1 and I3 are the results from the first and the first measurement of the low concentration sample, and H3 is the third reading of the high concentration sample. A recovery experiment is performed to estimate the proportional systematic error. It is not always necessary when another analytical method is available for comparison purposes. In this case, you spike in specific quantities of an analyte to the sample, and remember to take into consideration any dilutional or matrix effect on that baseline sample. Analyze all samples and calculate the difference between the spikes and the baseline samples, and the results should be compared to the amount added to determine the percentage recovery. It is desirable to perform this experiment in replicates, usually a minimum of triplicate analysis. And when taking into account the volume of the spike added, it is important to keep the volume of the spike in solution small to the relative volume of the original patient specimen to minimize any matrix effect. In terms of general performance, the dilution of the original sample should be no more than 10%. The concentration of the measure and added should be larger than the imprecision or the uncertainty of measurement at the system under test, and ideally at a clinical decision point. Percentage recovery can be calculated by the formula indicated. Measurement uncertainty of measured quantity values. In general, actions are taken to reduce to a minimum any uncertainty of measurement when reporting results. Once identified, those factors that have the capacity to cause significant variation must be reduced or controlled to an acceptable level. Factors which contribute to the uncertainty of test results include type A evaluations, and in this case, uncertainty is estimated based on the observation of actual variation obtained by repeat tests or measurements, and then applying basic statistical analysis. Sources of this data can include imprecision studies carried out at the time of assay validation or verification, or prospective observation of quality control results. Where possible, it is recommended that type A uncertainty is used, as this automatically takes into account uncertainties associated with each step of the process and is based on actual data rather than estimations. This is in contrast to type B evaluations, whereby in this case, uncertainty is estimated based on information rather than repeated readings. All factors which may impact the variation, for example, human factors, information from past experience or from calibration certificates are combined to produce an overall uncertainty measurement. When determining imprecision uncertainty of measurements, this can be achieved using internal quality control material. Again, those IQC levels are chosen to be closest to the values of most clinical importance, such as diagnostic or action threshold. And total analytical imprecision, CVA, for a single instrument can be calculated using the between batch variability of a measured QC value. Once total CVA is determined, the 95% predictive uncertainty interval is 1.96 times the mean CVA. Again, there are recognized standards available for this, and CLSI standard EP9 A3 recommends for verification precision experiments that five replicates over five days should be used to give 
25 data points per sample, and then these analyzed use ANOVAR to calculate CVA. It is not necessary to include within batch CV data, as the between batch IQC data should include all variation, reagent lot, change, operator change, and environmental conditions, for example. Note that uncertainty measurement estimates need to be included for the calculation of all derived tests. For most assays, analytical imprecision is a larger component to uncertainty than bias. Formal calculation of bias usually involves the use of certified reference materials or using data from external quality assessment schemes. The bias should be derived from data where the test concentration is similar to those used to determine the imprecision, and the percentage bias for an EQA sample can be combined with previous results to determine both the mean, which would be the B-score for UK and E-class EQA schemes, and the spread or standard deviation of bias. If the mean bias and also the mean plus or minus two standard deviations are both positive or negative, then there is possibility that a true bias is associated with that assay. Metrological traceability has been mentioned and is defined as the property of a measurement result whereby the result can be related to reference through a documented unbroken chain of calibrations, which each contribute to the measurement uncertainty. It is the sequence of measurement standards and calibrations that are used to relate a measurement result to a reference. The measurement uncertainty of results should therefore be metrologically traceable. The measurement uncertainties and bias are determined according to a metrological traceability chain. The accuracy, level of accreditation, laboratory, instability and cost per material increase significantly from medical laboratories to the top of the hierarchy. The measurement uncertainty bias and available materials decrease from bottom to top as illustrated in this diagram. There are plenty of references available for method validation and verification, and these are detailed here. And that concludes this presentation.